Hey friends, Drew Isbell here, back with Mission Mondays uh, for our Hope is Alive series. And uh, tonight we're going to be talking about the hope and the resurrection. Before we do, I'm going to sing the song Reckless Love by Corey Asbury. We're in the Diocese Chapel here because the acoustics are a little bit better and uh, hope it'll make me sound maybe a little bit better. So here we go. Never ending, reckless love. 
his love, God. It chases me down, fights to love, found leaves the night and night. And I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love. Hello friends, Drew Isbell here, Director for Evangelization for the Diocese of Joliet, and again we're in our second week now of our Monday mission for our series, Hope is Alive. And tonight we're going to be talking about the hope and the resurrection. Uh, if this is the first time that you're journeying with us, we are so glad you're here with us. Thank you for tuning in. And if it's your second night, hey, thanks for coming back. Uh, in our first night, we talked about the hope in the cross. And we talked about what it means to accept Jesus as our Savior and what his salvation kind of looks like for us as Christians. And part of that, uh, outside of just our salvation, right, um, is also that we are walking with Jesus. And that means that we have to take up our cross and follow him. And sometimes that means that we're going to experience trials and tribulations in this life. Uh, and those are difficult. Those are really difficult for us. But precisely in our trials and tribulations and in our sufferings is usually where Jesus meets us. That's usually where he wants to meet us, believe it or not. And uh, sometimes it takes those very difficult things in our lives for us to finally turn to him. And I think in a lot of ways, he knows that. And so we talked about what that means for us in, in giving our life over to Jesus and dying to ourselves. Tonight in the resurrection, we're talking about what it means to live in Christ. Uh, and that's a really exciting topic for us. So here's the thing, friends. All of Christianity hinges on one central claim. And that claim is Jesus Christ of Nazareth resurrected from the dead. That's what we believe. Okay. Now, if that is false, then all of Christianity makes no sense at all. Uh, Jesus just becomes a prophet. He becomes a kind man who may or may not have been uh, out there doing miracles, okay? But if it is true, in fact, it is true, then it's the greatest, most important event in all of human history. And so we're going to talk a little bit about what that is uh, in trying to learn more about is the resurrection really a true thing, okay? Uh, in the mid-1800s, legal scholar Dr. Simon Greenleaf decided he was going to put Jesus on trial. Greenleaf was a Harvard Law professor and was one of the major influences of bringing Harvard Law and putting it on the map. He's also the author of the three-volume legal masterpiece entitled A Treatise on the Law of Evidence. This work of Greenleaf's has been referred to as the greatest single authority an entire literature of legal procedure. The United States judicial system to this day relies upon the rules of evidence established by Greenleaf. Okay, so that's a big deal, right? And uh, Dr. Simon Greenleaf decided to put Jesus on trial. Would he hold up in the court of law? Would Jesus, the crime of the resurrection, hold up in a court of law? Now, if we're talking about a courtroom, we're talking about trying to prove that someone's guilty, okay? And one of the major things that we want to prove is, is there evidence? The more and more Dr. Simon started to research, the more and more evidence came about. And the evidence that he saw, which was really important to him, right, was the behavior of the disciples, each and every one of the disciples claimed to have seen Jesus in his resurrection. And so we talk about evidence, that's a big deal, right? But more important than that is eyewitnesses. If you have an eyewitness for a crime, 
then that person who is being prosecuted is going to be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. Because there's an eyewitness. Somebody saw with their eyes what they're being tried for. Now, what happens in this case if there's several, if there's several witnesses? Even more so than that, what if those witnesses are willing to die to prove that they saw the crime of Jesus' resurrection? Because that, friends, is the case with the disciples. They witness to Jesus in his resurrection by giving their life to prove that they saw Jesus rise from the dead. That's a big deal. In fact, when we think about the disciples, we think about St. Peter. He was hung upside down. He didn't see himself worthy enough to be crucified like his Lord. So he was, he was hung on a cross upside down. We have another disciple, friends, who was filleted alive. Okay, His skin was cut off. That's how he died. If it wasn't true, all they had to say was, it's not true. I'm not going to give my life for this because it's not true. But more than one person was willing to die to prove it. And in fact, maybe what's more impressive today is that it keeps happening. If we look at the martyrs throughout the years, throughout the 2,000 years of Jesus' resurrection and, and the belief in Jesus, there's been so many Christian martyrs. In fact, in 2015, we saw the Coptic Christians 21 of them lined up in orange jumpsuits on the beach, beheaded for their faith in Jesus. They had such a profound encounter with Jesus that they were willing to die for it. And for me, that's enough. For you, that might not be the case. Maybe for you, that's hard for you still to comprehend. And if it is, then I implore you to do some research like Dr. Greenleaf did. Uh, I implore you to do your own research and I'm, I'm certain that you're gonna arrive at the same conclusion. Jesus Christ of Nazareth really rose from the grave. Also, we have to keep in mind that when we're thinking about things like this and, and praying about things like this, if our approach is that I have to be able to prove it without a doubt that this totally happened before I can believe. Well, friends, we call that certainty and not faith. And that gets us into a little bit of trouble. And so I want to implore you to take with your mind also your heart when thinking about these matters. So if Jesus resurrected from the dead, what does that mean for you and for me? One is he says who he says he was. He is who he says he is. He said that he was going to resurrect from the dead in three days, right? Mark 9.31 says the Son of Man, this is Jesus talking, right? The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days, he will rise. Not only that, he was preparing us for this Easter moment in all of the Old Testament. We have the foretellings of multiple different stories that kind of set us up to know what's going to happen with Jesus. In theology, when we talk about how the Old Testament reveals the New Testament, how the stories and the people and the figures in, this, in the Old Testament point to and is very similar to what happens to the people in the New Testament, especially Jesus, we call that typology. Okay, and so these male figures especially are types or prefigurements of Jesus. And so I just want to touch on a couple of those. First, we have Isaac. He's put under a death sentence before God intervenes and saves him from his father Abraham during a three-day journey. While running from the Lord, Jonah is in the belly of the whale. And after three days, he rejoices in the Lord's protection from the storm and returns safely to dry land. It is said by St. Bede that Christ lay two nights in the tomb to rescue man from the twofold death of sin. 
that is a spiritual death from sin and a bodily death as its penalty. Okay, but what does this mean for us as Christians? Friends, this means that this world is not it for us. For us Christians, that means that all of the stuff and all of the baggage that we have, Jesus is going to take with him. See, he's resurrected, but that's not it. That's not the only thing. He didn't just resurrect from the grave. He's about to ascend to his father's house. And he's going to take all of our sin with him. He's conquered death. He's conquered sin. Jesus in himself has swallowed all of those things. And he's about to take all of our anxieties, all of our addictions, all of our sufferings, all of the agony, all of the temporary things that we experience on this life, Jesus takes to heaven. And he prepares a place for us. Scripture tells us that in my father's house, right, that there are many rooms, Jesus says. And so for all of us, the way of hope is opened by his resurrection. That means for you and me, we get to enter into that. In dying with the cross and dying to ourselves, we don't just die to ourselves and and that's it, right? In the resurrection, we actually get to be restored to new life. And in believing this, The scripture passage that really comes to mind for us right here is in 1 Timothy 2.4, that God wants all people to be saved, to come to the knowledge of the truth. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Okay, so now that I'm getting a little hot and bothered about the resurrection, I want to jump back into uh, a story for us, okay? And I know I've already talked a little bit about my upbringing, and I talked about high school for me and for college, and so I'm going to jump now to kind of post-college with the story, with my own personal story, okay? So now you're Drew post-college, And um, I get engaged to a beautiful woman named Amanda. Amanda and I get engaged and we get married and we get pregnant right away. And we're living in Colorado. Now, for those of you who have visited, Colorado is like the most beautiful place in the world. In fact, I often would say that in Colorado, where we lived at least, you had to actually try not to think about heaven when you were driving home. Because when I was pulling up into my apartment complex, I see the mountains, I see a beautiful sunset, and you see every single color that the Lord can bring, right? You see the purples and the oranges, and it's just unbelievable. And in this moment for us, when we're, uh, when we're married and we're living in Colorado for my, for my studies in theology at the Augustan Institute, uh, we have like our whole life in front of us, right? And the mountains are kind of calling our name every weekend. We have great friends, beautiful scenery, beautiful community. And I was so hopeful for for our marriage. We both were about the possibilities that were before us. And as we were kind of getting our family started, um, I decided that it was time for me to look at uh, a a full-time employment. I was currently working part-time, just half of, of the hours of the week, right? at the school. So I would go to school part-time and then I would actually work part-time as well. And that was all fine and good, but now that we had the baby on the way, I just felt like I needed more than that, right? And so I wanted to be able to provide for my family. But being very missionary-minded, I took a job as a missionary with a, a brand new missionary organization. Now, this brand new organization had a boss that had been kind of doing this work and kind of preparing the work for a couple years. But the, the missionary organization was, was really brand new. And I was one of two uh, of the brand new missionaries. And so my, my boss was a little bit maybe excited to get us out in the field. And uh, I was too. I was excited to maybe leave the classroom a little bit more and, and leave the actual school and really do some hands-on work in ministry. But the fundraising event that I was supposed to go and get trained at 
um, it was a few months away and I had just started my job. And so that's kind of what I was focusing on. I, I was really excited about that. But as I started with my boss, he told me that I wasn't going to be going to that fundraising event, that he was going to be able to, because he was a missionary beforehand, he was going to be able to train me in all the things that they were going to teach me. So I was going to be fine. Well, the problem for me was this was like a one week thing. Okay. And I just really hadn't mentally prepared myself for all of this. I didn't mentally prepare myself to be fundraising my salary, which is what I had to do as a missionary. And so all of a sudden I'm thrown into the field and asked to fundraise my salary. I send support letters to family and friends and I tell them a little bit about what the organization is about. And then I got a cold call them. Now, if it wasn't enough to be a little bit nervous about that, the prospect of all of that, uh, I had a pregnant wife. And to be honest, the idea of fatherhood and being a new husband was really getting to me. And so after my first week of training or so, I'm back at the apartment by myself. And Amanda now is working full time as a nurse. My pregnant wife is working full time as a nurse. And I basically have the whole day to myself to be able to cold call family and friends. Again, I, I don't feel ready for this. And I start to procrastinate a little bit. I start to put everything off maybe to the end of the day or end of the week. And I start to get really nervous and fear kind of overtakes me. Um, and quickly that fear just made me kind of stuck. And I didn't really do anything. I spent most of my time watching YouTube and eating junk food for about a month. Now, later on uh, in that month, I went home for a fundraising trip. What you're supposed to do is kind of cold call everybody and try to set up meetings, which I didn't do. And then you're supposed to kind of go to whatever area you're, you're headed to. And you're supposed to try to get meetings with family and friends or whoever you had written your support letters to. That's what I was doing. So I flew home to the suburbs of Illinois, where I'm from, and I'm with my mom. I'm back home with my mom, which is awesome. But all of my bad habits are still kind of there, right? One, I'm not praying. Two, I'm not reading scripture like I should be. My relationship with Jesus is poor. I'm staying up late into the night and I'm waking up late into the day. And my mom kind of noticed this. And one day uh, I decided to head over to the basketball courts near the house and play a little basketball and just start to ask myself the question like, Drew, are you, are you really made for this? Is this something that you really want to do, man? Am I supposed to be doing this? I was just a little bit confused at, at the prospect of, of what was kind of in front of me. So as I went home, I saw my mom, she was outside the house and she was gardening a little bit. And over the next hour or so, we had a very influential and important conversation. My mom started to explain to me, you know, you're one of the most excited people that I've ever been around. You're always hopeful. You're always filled with hope. You're always excited. You're always sharing your faith. Um, that's not happening right now. And I'm worried. Like, wh what's going on with all of this? She said, son, you seem like you're depressed. And I said, well, well yeah, I, I mean, I definitely feel like that in some ways. And I explained maybe some of my fears about the job. She said, you know, maybe, maybe the sadness that you're ex experiencing, maybe, maybe that's a way of, of God kind of showing you that this isn't what you're supposed to be doing. Maybe this job isn't something you're supposed to be doing. And I don't know, I, I didn't know what to make of that at the time. And then she said to me, she calls me Andrew, of course, full name age, because she's my mother. She says, Andrew, you know, you don't have to do this job. Maybe, maybe you're not supposed to do this job. And I thought about it for a while. And over the next couple of days, I decided she was right. I called my boss uh, at the time and, and I told him, you know, I, I don't think that I'm, I'm, I'm up for this, man. I, 
I thought that this was what I was supposed to be doing, but I just, I don't really think it is. And I quit the job and I was so relieved um, that my whole life was kind of put back in front of me and I wasn't in this place uh, that I was before. That was a really important time for me because my mom was trying to help me and, and steer me in the right direction. And a little bit later, my wife and I headed to Aspen, Colorado. Remember, we're living in Colorado. Uh, we're not too far from Denver. And we head up to Aspen because that's where her uncle is. He, um, he helps run the bus systems in Aspen. Uh, and we went up and we went to visit him. And on Sunday, we went to mass at St. Mary's in Aspen. And at the end of the mass, a young adult went up and she said that there was going to be an excursion retreat. There was one spot left. And what was going to happen is this community called the community of St. John of religious brothers was going to come to Aspen and they were going to run a week long retreat with young adults. And we were going to go up into the mountains and do adoration and prayer and have mass at the at the summit of the mountain. And then later in the day, we were going to have um, theology and philosophy classes. And I was listening for sure. But to be sure that I went on the, this excursion retreat, my wife told me, you have to sign up. <laughs> I think she had experienced with me uh, some of the agony of this new job and um, just the irregularity of it. And, and she saw the impact that, it was hap that was happening, especially on my spiritual life. So I was very lucky to have both my mother and my wife, two beautiful women, to really steer me in the direction that I was supposed to be going when I didn't know what direction to take. And I started to realize on that retreat excursion experience and the quiet that was forced upon us um, because you're, in the, you're up in the mountains and the beauty that I saw that over the last month or so, I had completely started to reject Jesus. I was so worried about what was going on that I started to turn towards things that weren't God. And I started to really put a lot of effort into those things to have some sort of experience of calmness or nostalgia. And nostalgia was not what Jesus is after, right? He's about new life. He's about life <laughs> to the full. That's why he came. And I had to really come to grips with that. I was wrestling so much with Jesus, wondering why he wasn't helping me when I was a missionary, wondering where he was in the midst of me selling out for him and, and going all in for him. Um, I think I missed the fact that maybe I wasn't doing the Lord's will. And thank God on that retreat and that excursion experience, I got to turn my life back over to my resurrected Savior. And I can't tell you the relief and the total joy that I had after that. Um, it was really an important turning point for me because it was first one, the first time I had doubted my faith. And then secondly, uh, the first time since my conversion that I had to really turn back towards Jesus and have a little bit of a reversion in my life and to put prayer back into my life and scripture back into my life. Um, that was a big deal for me. All right, friends. I tell you this story because it's the power of the resurrection. Even though it was a short time for me, it really had a big impact. Again, my fear never got better when I turned to things that weren't Jesus. Um, my sadness only grew. And when I turned back towards Jesus, he was able to breathe his life back into me. And that connection that I was able to experience with Jesus gave me back the life that he had given me. I wonder for you, when we start to talk about the things that maybe I was putting my worth in or the things that I was being consoled by that weren't of God, what are those things for you? What are those consolations that maybe aren't from God that you really uh, hold fast, maybe too tight to the heart? 
What are some of the vices that you put before Jesus? I want to encourage you tonight to let those go. For some, it may be a longer process than others. For most of us, we have to fight the same vices over and over again. But I want to remind you that Jesus has the power to break those chains that hold you. Give them to the resurrected Savior. If you need help in any other way as well, I encourage you to seek it out. This life is too short, friends, not to be on the right side of heaven. As we end tonight, what I'm going to do is is draw us into um, the passage where Mary Magdalene sees the resurrected Savior. This is in John 20, 11, where we see Mary is weeping outside of the tomb. So let's just place ourselves there for a moment. Peter and John have just seen the empty tomb and now Mary is there crying by herself. She sees the two angels there and they're, they're sitting there, if you remember. And that was where Jesus was before. And they're questioning why she's crying. She tells them, quote, they have taken away my Lord and I don't know where he is. Then says that she turned around and she saw Jesus, but she didn't recognize him. She actually asks Jesus if he carried Jesus away. But then the most important part of this exchange, Jesus says her name. Mary. And immediately she realizes it's him. What's important here is that Mary sees, she doesn't see Jesus at first without even realizing it's him. She, she sees him, but she doesn't see him. I wonder if any of us have ever had that issue before. Are there ever places in your life where Jesus is at work and you don't even realize it? I know there is for me. What would it take for you and for for you and for me to realize that that was Jesus speaking to us that he's working in our lives in this passage that he says uh, it says that he says Mary's name and her whole entire demeanor changes she instantly moves from sadness and weeping to rejoicing and she reaches out to Jesus now of course he still needs to ascend to heaven so he tells her not to hold on to him. The job isn't complete yet. Jesus calls her name and her sadness turns to joy. I wonder if we've ever allowed ourselves to encounter Jesus in this way. Notice that Mary is alone when she encounters Jesus. In the silence, he can call out to her. In that intimate setting, she then reaches out to her Savior. I wonder, have you, have you been able, ever, ever able to hear Jesus call your name? You ever heard him say, Tom, Lauren, Mario, Donna, Lisa, Julie? You ever heard Jesus call your name? Have you ever given him the space to do so? I say all those names because I know those people. They won't get angry at me. If you saw Jesus, uh, would you reach out to him? Would you be able to recognize his voice? Would he recognize yours? The great hope is that if you never have, or it's been a while, or for all of us that are Christians, you can return to the tomb where Jesus resurrected. It's a true statement, friends. It really happened. It's the most important event in all of history. And because it's true, I pray that you have the faith to believe that Jesus is calling your name in the silence of your heart. And I pray too that you can call out to him 
as well. God bless you. Thank you.